Dalmatian. Why are they serving? South Dallas. Let's talk about that for a second. So my next guest is Mr. Who Needs No Introduction, David C. Williams, who is AVP of AT&T. How's it going, man? Doing good, man. Glad to be here. I'm glad to get you on the show, too, man. It's been a yeah. while. You know, uh, I've been trying to connect with you for a second. <laughs> so tell me just a little bit about your background. Uh, Ooh, it has a very fascinating story, by the way. Sure, sure. So, um, yeah, David Williams, Assistant Vice President, AT&T Automation. Um, I lead one of the largest uh, robotics process automation programs worldwide. Uh, we complete over 70 million transactions automated and about 400 million in operating income annually. Um, have an extremely diverse team, um, you know, a couple of patents along the way. I won an Engineer of the Year Award last year and I'm real happy to, uh, pleased to say that my team won an IT uh, Team of the Year Award this year. So nice. It's been a nice ride. Very nice. So what is automation? What does that even mean in the AT&T universe? Yeah. So you have, um, you know, traditional stacks like IT or information technology stacks um, that do a lot of platform and heavy lifting. What my team does is a lot of hyper automation. We come through and we look at systems and maybe system A doesn't talk to system B and we figure out a way in a low cost way to get system A and system B to talk to each other. Or maybe we'll do some desktop orchestration and we'll get 10 or 12 systems to talk to each other and do something that they haven't done before. Or we even take different approaches in how systems even work all together. And maybe we just get rid of all the systems. I like to call it a none tool strategy. And maybe we'll just have a web page with a bunch of APIs piped into it and we'll deliver a really simplified uh, experience for users. Okay. So artificial intelligence has been around for over, you know, about 30 years now, probably a little bit longer than that. Yeah. How did walk us through this journey from this guy from South Dallas? <laughs> you know what, what you know your background sure. how did he end up following this path was this just something that was ingrained in you from the beginning or well you know i would say if there's anything that was ingrained it was probably a couple of things one is um, i'm creative like most children start off very creative i just happen to hold on to it and um, i would submit to anyone um, to hold on to their creativity it, it helps you in every industry whatever industry you go into and the other is I, I do come from South Dallas, and to put that in perspective, if you went to a bad area of town and asked, what's a bad part of town, they would say South Dallas. Yeah. So, you know. Think First 48? Right. Watts of L.A., Marcy of, of New York, mm -hmm. Caprini Greens and Chi-Town. Chi right, right. And so, um, you know, it's a lot of hardships there, and you learn how to make a dollar out of 15 cents. You learn how to make ends meet. I watched my mother do that time and time again. Well, I believe that that's a transferable skill. Just a lot of times, people who come from underserved communities, people who are anomalies that wind up in these corporate roles, a lot of times we leave that big mama's teaching in the car, in the parking lot. We don't take them to the office with us. I say, I take it with me. And so, you know, my team, you know, we do a lot of uh, big numbers, but we also have like a 4,000% ROI. Mm. That's making a dollar out of 15 cents, right? right? If a CFO could make a dollar out of 15 cents that for just one quarter, that CFO would be CEO. That's a 600% return. We've been living under roofs, you know, watching our parents, our uh, guardians, our grandmothers do those same things. Yeah. You familiar with the movie Slumdog Millionaire? Yeah. You know, I always thought that was one, that's one of my favorite movies because it's, 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 if you're not paying attention, it's difficult to follow. But oftentimes, a lot of people really, they, they look at the position that we're in, but we never really know the journey that got there. Right. You know, the irony is this guy was not educated at all, but he became a product of his environment, which happened to think about um, the, the, guy, the guy, the main character, like no one really paid attention to, you know, all the adversity that he had to go through to get to the point he was, but every scenario that he was put into, the most dangerous of them, they landed him right in the place and gave him exactly the answers that he needed right when he needed him to actually hit that jackpot. You know, and it sounds like that's kind of similar to your story. Yeah, man. Look, I believe in, you know, in exercising your faith. I went to India, okay? And there's a story in India about a guy named Lord Rama. Okay. Lord Rama. They rolled the R. Long story short, Lord Rama was a crown prince. He got exiled lived in the forest, his wife was kidnapped. He mustered up a small militia. They traveled to the south of India, built a bridge across the ocean to uh, Sri Lanka, had a battle, 
to go get his wife back. I, I, I ask myself at times, like, yo, man, do I have the, am I exercising that kind of faith that I believe that no matter what I go through, I will always be able to overcome it. They have a celebration every year that celebrates that, that whole journey he had. They call it the Valley Festival, the festival of celebration of lights, because no matter how much darkness there is, there will always be light, mm -hmm. like slumber. Right. So given your background, the social impact that you believe that AT&T does. And, and before we get into that, just give me your perspective on social, the social climate when it comes to how the technology that AT&T has and just in your realm of uh, expertise, mm -hmm. how that really impacts, whether it be negative, positive, or indifferently, mm -hmm. uh, people who have a, a challenging background. Okay. So there's probably two sides of that coin. Uh, one is, at the corporate level, what does AT&T do in regards to people who have challenged backgrounds and how technology relates to them? In that space, um, what we're doing is, at a corporate level is uh, trying to break, trying to close the digital divide. Mm -hmm. And so, hold up, let's bring that back and break it down. Okay. Close the digital divide. Close that is the, such a big idea. It is. It's, it's huge, right? That now, is such it's, a big idea. It, it's huge, but it's it's just a couple of tenants that I must speak to or that AT&T as a corporation are focused on. And so one is providing low cost and sometimes free broadband to underserved areas, okay. neighborhoods. And the way that we're doing that is we're partnering with um, the federal government, the state governments, and a lot of school ISDs mm -hmm. so that they can enable these students who are living in these underserved neighborhoods to have access to decent broadband so they can do homework and video and all the things that um, school requires today because it's way different. It's not just pen and paper anymore, right? Right. And so, exactly, exactly. It's exactly. a totally different, you know, delivery system of education. Exactly. Whether you're talking all sorts of video-centric teaching, right, mm -hmm. lessons. Um, so trying to provide that broadband to those uh, areas. Also at the corporate level, what we're doing is going into different places like the MLK Center in your city or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever, and helping to equip some of those places, not only with high-speed broadband, 5G, but also the, you know tablets and computers and things so that folks can have uh, um, the abilities to go use these things mm -hmm. in a central location where you know we have a relationship with you know the Dallas Chamber of Commerce and, right. and MLK Center and all those things. So at a corporate level, that's what that means. For me, look, I, I'm in automation. Uh, I didn't have a traditional journey into the role that I'm in. Um, because of my journey, um, I'm indifferent. I'm, I'm not indifferent. I'm, I'm um, very open to, I'm very um, considerate of the fact that everyone's journey will not be the traditional right. journey. So some folks on my team have PhDs. It's like Neo in the Matrix. Right. Some folks are not that on that uh, end of the spectrum from a technical perspective, but they know process. Mm -hmm. They know where the bodies are buried. And so, you know, I hired and promoted a lot of black women, black men, Hispanic men and women, Asian, LGBTQ, folks living with disabilities, uh, veterans, um, because I believe that the way to achieve that 4,000% ROI, one word, diversity. Mm. Okay. You gotta have people that don't look like you, think like you, looking at the same problem. That's how you come up with the best solution. When we think about skill sets, like what do you specifically look at? Because and, and here's a challenge in, in my space okay. um, and, and, and for a lot of my clients. You know, it's funny you talking about the Dallas Black Chamber, uh, those resources at the MLK Center. We have people that literally come up to, uh, you know, me sitting on the board that will lean up on our building just to get access to the Wi-Fi that we have because they mm -hmm. don't have it in there. Right. Kids right. that will sit in the right. community center yeah. just to get access to oh, it. Man. So it's a tremendous Or sit in help. the parking lot at the uh, McDonald's. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah absolutely, yeah. 100%. But uh, when we think about you know the, the whole diversity piece um, and skill sets, one of the things that um, I do in my own practice is I don't look for people who have uh, 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 foreign policy chops. Okay. Because they already think like me. I don't need another one of me <laughs> sitting in a room making decisions. I need someone who is going to be, you know, I, when I make those considerations, I need someone who's on, on the, uh, the opposite end of the spectrum where they can think about how a decision that a corporate uh, client that we serve uh, makes in policy is really going to mean for them right. on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. So when you guys look at it, diversity, 
uh, what are some of the priorities that you have? Yeah, so um, careful you know, with that. Yeah, I know, right? So for me, one of the the number one skill sets or or traits that I'm looking for is grit. One of the main questions I asked in those promotions, and it might have been like twenty or so, right? One of the main question I asked is, what do you do when someone tells you no? Okay, thank you for that answer. What do you do when they say no the second time? Thank you for that answer. Now I'd like to know, what do you do when they say no again? And this is a serious question in the interview. This is kind of make or break for me because I can teach you technology, I cannot teach you passion. And I need you to have that kind of passion because with the technology that we're going to use, we're gonna, everything that we're going to do, somebody said you couldn't do it. Everything that we're going to do, somebody said it was impossible. 4,000% ROI. Look, I'm talking $400 million in operating income. The year before that, it was only 43. The year before that, it was only eight. The year before that, it was only two. So we're on an exponential curve still. This year, we're looking at a billion, right? And so it's an exponential curve. Everything that we're doing, somebody said, you can't do this. I can teach you the technology. I can show you the strategy through the culture, but I need you to have that grit inside of you. I need you to come with that in you. Okay. So let me push your buttons on this one. All right. Because of the space that you operate in, mm -hmm. automation. How are you even, how can you ensure that you're getting the the, 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 camp, the applicants that you are actually looking for in that diversity space? Because, and I'm asking this question because, we know yep. that now through those systems, they are looking for specific types of people, specific skill sets, and the computer through automation will will not show this person is qualified for this role for getting it. Those so kind how of, do you even yeah. navigate that? How do you instruct your people to sure. navigate that? So so those kind of things can happen, and they do happen <laughs> at, on a broad scale. Okay, let's not be you know naive about it. Um, there's probably a couple of things I say to it. So one is um, when I, I I do a lot of mentoring, I, and I believe in mentoring. I was mentored, and it did the world for me. It helped me so much, and so I mentor a lot of other folks. And so in that process, we talk specifically about what it is you need to do going through the hiring process. I've been around long enough. I've done it enough. I've, I've hired enough. I've Watch others higher enough. Here are the actual things. I'm giving you the cheat codes on what you need to be doing when you apply for the job. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you to lie and do something, you know, dishonest, but I'm going to tell you this is what it needs, this is where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if that's your resume. It, the resume, resume the entire professional on the program. resume in the digital application okay. the pre-screen questions the what all of that I'm gonna talk mm -hmm. you through the entire process the interview the whole thing but um, the question then comes from a protege or mentor how do you feel about this do you feel like you can answer these questions and, and have these responses if not then maybe there's some more work we need to do to get you ready so that you can answer this honestly and do these and have these qualities and so forth. And I'm gonna be there for that. But that's what I believe is true mentoring. I'm, you know, um, people play with that word mentor, mentor yeah. versus sponsor. You know, everybody is mentor is not your sponsor. I say, look, if you're not gonna, like, if you're not gonna sponsor me, why are you mentoring me? Hmm. Good question. All right. If you're president so and so and I'm someone you think is worth pouring into, and I'm taking all of your advice, are you just building an entourage, or are you trying to really grow the circle to help us have black excellence on another level? That's an interesting um, perspective, interesting question, because when we talk about sponsorship, we talk about a different level of endorsement. Right, right, yeah. Like, you, you, you stand behind those credentials that they have yeah. and, and the integrity of that person's work. You know, and I was thinking about that topic in automation because like currently right now, one of my clients, they have about 1,800 jobs open. I look at the job numbers from um, from last month, where it's like 212 new opportunities open uh, in the U.S. And then I think so uh, a little bit broader about that, because like even with my hiring practices, the third party that I use, they tell me that people aren't qualified. So I go straight to LinkedIn and start and do my own application, and they do the filtering as well. And it's people who have skill sets that it's like, 
you know, I don't want to advertise a role right. and say that, you know, you don't need these, you don't really need these skills when all reality, you, you do, do need these skills. Correct. It's just that I can teach you. Correct. And I need you to think a little bit differently. Yeah. So, so I, I think you have to be intentional. There's mm -hmm. no way it happens. You cannot, I don't care who you are as a hiring manager, what color, what gender, what whatever you are. You have to be intentional, right? I, myself and a few folks that uh, joined me on that hiring panel, we were intentional that we were going to hire a diverse group of people. We started off with that. Then we went after, you know, we're looking for what we were looking for. But at that point, we had already made a decision. We're gonna have more, we will have more women, we will have more people of color, we will have more LGBTQ, we will have, we will have everything. We'll have more of all of this. And this from your ERG community and is it a corporate goal or? Well, so, so this was David's Okay, so this is an effort, right? Now at the corporate level, um, there's a few things that go into that. I'm a, I'm a member, a proud member of a lot of ERGs, uh, employee resource groups um, at at and and there's two sides of that coin. One, the ERGs promote opportunities to their members and let them know, hey, here's something that's available. You may not have even known about. On the other side, those ERGs give people an opportunity to have leadership roles, whether it's secretary or the treasurer or the co-chair or the committee chair or chairman or whatever, and they have an opportunity to um, um, exercise and flex those skills in a space with business leaders. So they get to see this person flex those leadership skills. And it's like, okay, now you've made a connection. Now you know someone, uh, an, an executive that you didn't know before, and this executive knows you for your leadership skills. Mm -hmm. So now it's, you're one step closer to making that, that leap, right? And those things happen organically, Okay. right? Yeah, and that's, you know, that's intentional. Mm -hmm. It's something that I think that is helpful. I'm gonna tell you a quick story about, um, and it was a CEO that um, was at at and that shall remain nameless, <laughs> uh, but my very first meeting when I was um, uh, first put on the board of directors of the uh, Regional Black Contract Association, mm -hmm. uh, my very first public meeting was to go up here and talk to this CEO. And uh, the chairman, I don't think it's a secret to this chair, but he really don't give a damn. Uh, the very first meeting, fresh out of law school, and he, um, he sits there and he says, uh, you guys, he said, y'all problem is y'all don't hire black people. He said it just like that. And uh, of course, I was shocked because I didn't know anything about it at the time. But then he went down to history and we and had me look into some data and statistics. Uh, Bell South came up and all the different uh, uh, customers, the customer base, the most loyal customer base that at t had at the time with all these iterations, all these transformations. Mm -hmm happened to be uh, a black, that black customer base mm -hmm. that literally stuck through all these uh, mm -hmm. transformations, particularly in the South. And I have noticed a lot of change. Internally, do you, do you notice any change in, uh, see change in uh, its corporate environment? Yeah, you know, so leaving the CEO's nameless, um, there was a, a, a CEO of the company that made a public statement, made a, a few public statements, but one uh, very early, he said, look, um, our company is going to look like the people we serve. It's going to reflect the communities and the people we serve. And I believe that he made material strides in that direction. He did a lot of things, um, you know, tied, you know, executives pay to certain diversity metrics. You know, I mean, he really tried to put some teeth to it. Now, you can't run all of that from just one chair through a company of 200,000 right. people, right? Right, right? But I do believe that he put the, you know, the company's focus or direction in the right direction. Um, and it played out, you know, fairly well. Um, I think that there are other CEOs, uh, other officers of the company that started things like uh, AT&T Dreamin' Black, mm -hmm. uh, which just won a few awards this year for being a great program. Um, at t believes, believes Chicago, believes Dallas, uh, believes Atlanta, uh, where they're helping um, in Chicago with the violence and Dallas with homelessness and Atlanta mm -hmm. with other things. Um, and so it's been, it, it, I would say that they, you know, uh, you know, leaving them nameless, going back a couple of CEOs, you know, guys started a chief diversity office mm -hmm. to specifically look at right. 
you know, uh, addressing the problem. And so uh, I think there's been some changes. You know, at and is 146 years old. It's lived through everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm exactly. saying? Exactly. Good, bad, or indifferent. It's lived through. When we think about that age, um, <laughs> do you believe that, like, I just, just your perspective yeah. on um, where we are socially, you know, in the corporate space, because corporations, obviously, you mentioned the, um, the, uh, the public-private partnerships that you have with the government. Pu uh, corporations, they naturally have a role to play with uh, so, so, uh, social trends. Uh, there sure. are a lot of um, people who feel a certain way about um, the priority of DE&I. Mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that the benefits are worth that shakeup? And how do you even manage that change? Because that this concept itself is is new in our social space, right. but it's been around forever. Right. It's been around forever. Right. Like when you MLK civil sure. rights movement, right. even pre nineteen sixty civil rights movement, women wanted the right to right. vote. No, like Correct. that's Correct. always been Correct. an American Correct. sentiment. Correct. But this is the first time we actually labeled it this way. Correct. Which is funny because America has always been a diverse. Nation is just that <laughs> some people, it was more of a class thing than right. and a servitude thing than it has ever been. But now we call it this now, and it's like, is it really worth the, the fight? Yeah, I think so. You know, um, I've seen a number of presentations, reports, uh, dossiers that break this down. And, and the bottom line is, you know, com corporations with diverse board of directors outperform companies with homogenous board of directors. That, that's that's a fact you know which I didn't I didn't know that yeah, until recently, yeah. but and, that is a fact and, and 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 it's not just at the board level you can keep going down that uh, chain of command mm -hmm. and, and and it still holds true executive and, management c-suite all that and so and so there's been uh, a, a concerted effort really to try to address it and you say you know at and has been around 146 years we talked about that um, you know there are certain movements that AT&T was on the progressive side of it before it was accepted. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and there's a number of them, whether you're talking, um, you know, civil rights with uh, African Americans or civil rights with LGBTQ or civil rights with uh, veterans and their rights, right? I mean, AT&T has taken a public stance. I mean, year after year after year, I mean, I can't quote them right now, but I don't know, back in the 60s, 70s, they had these different timelines of where AT&T took a stance before it was law, took a stance before it was law, took a stance before it was law. And so we try to stay on the right side of progression. I mean, what we do, what we build enables progressiveness, 5G, Wi-Fi, uh, smartphones, apps, broadband, you know, fiber, all this stuff. It enables those things. And so in our DNA, we believe of, about being progressive. Now, sure, we're a conservative company. We're trying mm -hmm. to you know, do things financially, you know, savvy and all that. But we are a progressive company in our mind state of where we want to be or who we want to be as a company. Mm -hmm. Do we get there all the time? Maybe not. You know, maybe not as far as we like to go. Maybe not as fast as we want to go. But I think that we're, we're pointed in the right direction. Now, when you think about uh, AT&T as a, a fiscally conservative mm -hmm. um, organization, but uh, socially they they are you know quite progressive. Um, they've also taken advantage of the the, the liberal world order. Uh, when I say that, we talk about the expansion of its products, its services, its offerings, and its partnerships uh, beyond American borders. Yes. Um, when we think about what you specifically do, automation, yep. do you have any reflection on um, some of the things we've seen uh, over the last 10 years in that space when we think about the bot space, the implications in the 2016 uh, election, even pre that, um, some of the, like the Sony hacks and things that we saw, there a lot of those were vulnerabilities yeah. that we had in the technologies that we use and a lot of those back doors were, were channels that they use an American business to get into the certain systems yeah. to shut down things. So Yeah, so everything that we do, I mean we're we're a connectivity company, a technology company, but everything we do, we wrap it in security. And so not only are we fiscally conservative, but from a cybersecurity perspective, right. like, oh my God, we have on a belt, suspenders, duct tape, staples, you know, I mean right. the whole nine. 
And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. just to be clear, you guys didn't have a hand in any of that, but we see more and more yeah. companies as this technology advances and speeds up. A lot more companies yeah. that we never would have thought are, are experiencing these hacks. And, yeah, and so and so we we spent a lot of money, a lot of resources investing into the cybersecurity space, uh, partnering with all of the the various departments um, that are in that space, whether it's military down to local branches and you know communities. What about uh, internally, AT and T? Do y'all have a y'all have a global compliance office? Oh like, yeah. How big is it? And do oh, your yeah. office actually? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So them? yeah, I, I work with our compliance and corporate security teams all the time, um, and they're very present in almost every facet of the business. Whether you're in customer service or working in the store or a technician outside installing internet, um, they're very ingrained into all of the processes. Okay. Right and. For me, a technologist, someone who's trying to reinvent the future, right? A lot of times we're having conversations to make sure that as we reinvent, we don't step outside of some boundary and create a new vulnerability, right? We, you know, play within the guardrails, and if we need to push the envelope, we'll push it together in a secure way. You know, th- to that very point, um, when the pandemic hit, all right, it forced everyone to be sheltered in place, and. AT&T is a telecommunications company. The FCC regulates that telecom Mm -hmm. operators, when employees are working from home, cannot have access to a social security number, a date of birth, a credit card number. Mm -hmm. That caused a big bottleneck. If I can't take a payment or make a sale, man, it's hard to make business, okay? And at a time in the pandemic when so many people needed to get connected, right, with smartphones and all that, right? And so, Myself and my team, we figured out a solution to enable 40,000 people working around the world to be able to work from home and still be able to complete those transactions in a secure manner Mm -hmm. without having everything encrypted, without having to worry about new vulnerabilities and still be able to enable that. 40,000 people take 800,000 calls a day. That's a lot of folks that need, especially at that point in time, needed how many hospitals, schools, law offices wow. needed to get those services? Yeah, right. To stay afloat. Yeah, Small just to, yeah, especially. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's absolutely, you know, it's crazy that you would mention that because you know I was thinking about the American Innovation Act, and I wanted to touch on a couple of things in it, but to hear that story, it just, um, it just. It just kind of crystallized how wrong the policymakers, you know, <laughs> are getting this because the overall spirit is to protect, to protect uh, little guy. Yeah. And I guess we could say consumer yeah. of these technologies yeah. uh, from big tech, if you will. But I think that's the wrong way to actually look at it, especially you use the term reinvent the future. That is innovation. Like we change the way we do things to advance what we're doing. Uh, from a policy level, a lot of that stuff. Have you looked at it? Just a little. Just a little bit. Just a little. Uh, you know, I'm not going to even bring out too much of that. I might put my phone out here in a second, but just from a policy level, how do you feel about the way um, our government is handling a lot of this, the regulation, the regulatory uh, framework around technology? Because yeah. it essentially does not exist outside right. of a compliance. You know, standard. in a lot of spaces, right? Right. Um, you know, I think that the way that we, um, the way that laws and rules get put into place around technology, at a corporate level, the way at and talks about it is, look, we just say, look, it's okay to put laws and rules, we just want them to be fair, right? Don't treat us differently than you might treat another company doing the same thing that we do. Mm-hmm. And now you're giving preferential treatment to them where, you know, not to us. And, and AT&T has lived through that in a number of different instances where the laws came out and, and AT&T was somewhat handcuffed and penalized uh, by the law and, and had to, 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 to work through that. Uh, Telecommunications Act, you know, all that Texas Comm South stuff. You know? mm-hmm. And so, uh, where they never built a phone company. Right, 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 right. Right, right, that's a, right, right. PR right. stunt action. Right, and so, um, we just don't want those things to, to happen again. And that's our stance. Um, but when it comes to, um, you know, regulation across the internet, um, new services, social media, crypto, all those things, 
Um, you know, we sit at the table we, as much as we can to, you know, to, to be a part of the dialogue and hopefully to, to uh, um, you know, share our perspective on it. But at a, at, a, at a macro level, our goal is we just want fair regulation. We, look, we don't want to beat up anybody, nor do we want to get beat up. We just want to compete. And we think that we got stuff that, to sell that's competitive. In the American Innovation Act, it assumes that um, a tech company has the ability or uh, can gain the capability to control 25% of a person's data. Uh, and when you think about something like that, that's such a broad statement. <laughs> it is so bold to say that. But how off base are they with that? Like, let's really think about it. Um, prime example, on um, certain platforms, certain um, apps that we use, uh, Snapchat being one, the end user can save messages that the, the, sender. the sender has deleted. Correct. And the sender, an example, decides that they want to change their life. You know, they sent that, you know, that cock shot or that, you know, that those booby shots, they sent that. Sexing, which is something that happened, happened. today. Um, but then they don't know that the, the end user still has that. Yeah, yeah. How can that, you know, change a person's life? I mean, it gets out. Yeah, I mean, it could be detrimental. And, 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 and also, just to layer on top of that, the Snapchat on that data? Right. Or does this end user or the sender? I think the U, the EULA, the end user license agreement from Snapchat probably says that they own it. You know, no one reads the terms and conditions anymore, right? Yeah. Um, and and. But is that twenty five percent of this? So the, the question of can a technology company own or control twenty five percent of a user's data? Look, some people live off their smartphone. Live. Off of it, eat, wake up, work, play, entertain. That's where they get their dinner. Uber eats all. All of it, you know. And so, absolutely, I think that uh, you know it is possible. It is feasible for um, someone to have shared more than twenty five percent of their data that sits in, you know, a couple different um, platforms, right? Whether it's Netflix, Amazon, whatever. Um, I think what those platforms do with that data becomes the question. And if the end user is at least aware or conscious that they're given this data, like for example, most people are okay with giving Google or Apple their location data in exchange for the, the convenience of GPS, right? That's a mm -hmm. fair exchange of data, mm -hmm. okay? You know, you may not drive very much. Let's say you don't own a car, but you're still okay with it. You know, you use it every now and then. Somebody else who's an 18, well, they use it every day, mm -hmm. right? So that's a different proportion of how much Google is using in those two different users. But in either case, it's an, a fair exchange. I will give you this in exchange for that. I think when it, it gets weird and, and the reason for legislation is when it's not a fair exchange. When someone's taking that data and they're not being okay. upfront about it, or if someone's taking that data and doing something that you didn't off, you didn't believe that they should do, that's when I think it gets weird and regulation is ideal to help with those. Right. So under this new proposal, uh, they'll have 180 days to actually um, to propose regulations, how to regulate the, uh, the policy once it's completed. It hasn't made it over to the Senate mm -hmm. for, uh, for debate, which I'm pretty sure you get watered down at that point. But then uh, another aspect of the bill is what a user, how they can actually uh, uh, be made whole or retaliate against a technology company. So I was thinking about, like, when you talk about the example that you gave with the truck driver who may use this, uh, this Google map uh, every single day in their day-to-day -day work, well, should his baby mama be able to track him on that? And should it be, you know, should Google be allowed to give her access to that? Or employer? Yeah, I mean, so it all goes back again. I mean, look, you're the lawyer. It goes back to <laughs> end user license agreement. 
no one reads the T's and C's, right? So, you know, everyone has worked from home just about in the world now at some point. Or not everyone, but a lot of people. And so, um, you know, whether they read it or not, I'm sure your employer owns the data on the device that you're using. Right, and so if you choose to, if you choose to to use that device and do something that you don't want your employer to know, that was your choice. Mm -hmm. Now you know, I mean, maybe that wasn't crystal clear when you picked up that laptop or smartphone or whatever. I don't know. I mean, it's twenty twenty two. We've kind of right. been doing this dance for a while. I don't think right. this is new information, you know, right. for most people. It's very true. Yeah. It's very true. Uh, so, you know, it goes back to being careful about what you do with your data. And, you know, I, you, you can't sign up for everything that comes through. You can't answer every spam call. You can't, you know, like all of that stuff is, you know, the first time you answer one, now enough two, three, two, three more going to call you, right? So exactly. you're giving that data away pieces at a time. Yeah. And I think the question is, like, because the company, the tech company has that much access and they're being trusted with that much access uh, to a person's data, then they monetize off of that. If it has harmful impacts, should that user be able to have the right, you know, to be made whole based on that? And of course, that's going to impact the user agreement. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to impact how how uh, tech companies and uh, platforms actually, you know, they sign up that entire process. It, that is definitely going to interrupt because. The first, the number one thing that the state has to do is protect protect individual rights. Hopefully, yeah. that, no, that's <laughs> that, you know constitutionally that is their number one job. Right. If nothing else, national security and protect and protect the individual rights. Right. So that that's literally what we have to do and how we need to think about. We have to talk think about um, uh, policy. Yeah, I, I think it, it's a slippery slope, right? So somebody sends whatever kind of um, sexually suggestive t uh, DM through. Instagram or Facebook or whatever, you know. Snapchat me that. Mm. <laughs> and so, however, whatever transpires, something goes south and the person is, you know, um, not feeling good about the scenario. It becomes a slippery slope to say, Facebook, you owe me this amount of money. Now, I'm not saying Facebook doesn't own some responsibility and maybe they owe some money. Maybe, you know, depending on the scenario, you know, was it the phone hacked? Was it this? Was it that? Was it, I don't know. But that's a very slippery slope because, I mean, we've seen it, you know, in, in policy where as someone makes a precedent in, in, doing, in filing a lawsuit, mm -hmm. here comes the avalanche. Right. And whether we agree with that or not, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, all these big tech giants are the ones that are inventing the future, giving us the things that we want to do. Right. You know, we want to video chat with each other. We want to have 10 video chats going. We want to have Zooms going. We want to have, you know, and so I think the government has to keep in mind, like, you know, these companies are not going to keep reaching for the moon if there's, you know, a zillion different pitfalls in doing it and so it's it's a it's a it's a delicate balancing act i don't pretend to have it you know mastered i imagine a lot of our uh, legislators don't have it mastered either but you know i think that this public discussion and putting some um, influence on our own as constituents on our own regulators about how we feel about these things is the way to go because that's about all they're going to listen to right and the cbo haven't even come up with a budget right they don't. They have no clue how much money is going to get spent in this space. How much money we really need, and there's not even a real. And, and my concern about the legislation itself is it puts you know corporations who really are inventing the future. It puts them at the end of the barrel of the gun. Right. Because now at this point, it's like you're saying, hey, we want you to have a public-private partnership with us, but we're oh, also going to make it as difficult oh, possible for you yeah. to innovate. Right. You know? Right. So AT and T spends about twenty billion dollars every year investing in the United States. We invest more money in the United States than any company in the United States, and we've been doing that for the past ten or fifteen years. And um, we do that predominantly building out five G, building out more broadband, trying to get to more neighborhoods. Um, I believe 
don't quote me on this, but I believe we build three to five times more than the second place person building stuff out in these uh, areas. Um, but you just can't get everywhere fast enough. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the problem. And the demand is through the roof. You know, if you go back to the advent of the iPhone to now, mobile data has uh, increased like 1 million percent. It's hard to even fathom that right. number in a literal exactly. sense. You know, yeah. like if traffic tripled, now imagine if it million, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's hard to, yeah. to, to fathom that. But for us, traffic has went 1 million times higher. And we've had to deal with that. We've had to keep investing and building on that. And, you know, I think for companies that are spending that kind of money, nobody wants to, you know, get in a space like that and then feel like, you know, you're not going to have a good opportunity to get a return on it because you're going to get hit with a bunch of legislation that's going to penalize you for everything that you do. And so, again, I just think it's a, a huge balancing act that folks have to, you have to thread that needle properly. Otherwise, you're going to slow down innovation or you're gonna leave a bunch of customers vulnerable to you know being misused. Okay. I wanna take a different little turn and just get some uh, personal thoughts that you have about uh, the metaverse. Uh, <laughs> like what do you think about that space? Because like, okay, it's a new term, we have a term for it, but virtual space is, you know, it we've we've been existing in that right. and it's just evolving. Now right. we just we are the like, Sims now. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. We're literally being placed in it, right, you know, and right. have to operate in it in a different type of way. But I think people just waking up to it now. Like, Look, what are your, your thoughts? All right, so this is some, some this is not AT and T. This is my thoughts. All right? uh, so, okay. so one, I absolutely love the metaverse. I, I love the whole concept of everything that goes along with it. Um, but I also look at the metaverse and I say it was ingenious because look, Google is the index of the internet. Right, that is how, you know, being and others are trying, you know, but Google is the index of the internet. That's how you get around it. And um, they have a, a beach head, a beach front that you just cannot beat. They have it yeah. kind of, and Mark Zuckerberg figured out a way to take that and put it in the metaverse. <laughs> where before you would search for things using keystrokes and now you walk around and travel. And so where you had McDonald's.com and I had McDarrell's.com or McDonald.com, mm -hmm. right? It was close proximity. Mm -hmm. In the metaverse, that means nothing. In the metaverse, Snoop's house is here and mine is next to it. That's proximity. Mm -hmm. Like, and so I think it's genius that Zuckerberg has put that together. Um, and it's, it's a wildly successful platform. I think folks ought to spend money, get involved see what all you can do with it. Um, I'm definitely um, experimenting with some things uh, in, the, in the metaverse. I got a book coming out. I'm trying to set up some stuff in the metaverse, and so that'll be kind of cool. Okay. So what about the targeted audience, which is investor community and also the kids? Yep. That, that's, a, that's a different world. Yeah. So at that point, yeah. So uh, again, going back to investment, right? Zuckerberg, Facebook, let me take him out of it. Facebook spends this amount of investment to go build this new world, which is really what it is a simulated world. And um, if they are going to um, try to re get a return on that investment, they're looking for early adopters. Yes. Who is going to be an early adopter? Mm -hmm. People with money. Um, 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 you know, uh, addition, uh, dispensable or discretionary, excuse me, funding mm -hmm. um, that can play in that space. And there's also going to be young folks that are interested and curious about it. And already understand it. And there so that'll be, a, learn yeah, so that'll be the ecosystem for a minute. And then, you know, the investor community will grow. It'll grow into you know, folks that are maybe a little older or the metaverse will be around a little bit longer and the younger folks will grow up into and be at, at a different age in the metaverse and as young people come into it, now you have a whole new population into it. Some folks, whether of a certain age or just a certain belief, don't want to play in the metaverse space at all. Okay? Just like, you know, some folks want to call the phone company or call the 
water company and pay their bill versus paying it online mm -hmm. or you know automatic uh, payments. That still happens today, and that same dynamic where you know folks don't want to necessarily participate in that digital space. This is just another iteration of it. Yeah. So here's my concern about that. And I was listening to the Breakfast Club a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. and everybody called up and they laughed about it. But there was a woman who filed a, um, a suit against um, a company because she would she claimed that she felt as though she was sexually harassed in this uh, in this virtual space, and and uh, and that sounds ridiculous for this woman to say that. Now imagine this is a twelve year old girl. Like, when we think about virtual spaces, virtual currencies, uh, and things, that entire ecosystem, a lot of sex trafficking happens there. Uh, a lot of teenagers have all of these, uh, these mental health issues and uh, 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 get significantly impacted by their presence in a virtual world. A lot of those girls that's on Instagram, they got these fake um, profiles and stuff. They're taking pictures in their restroom and they're taking pictures at some place that their parents dropped them off. That world that they're living in is something they project online. Mm -hmm. It's not their actual life because when they go home, right. they have to make the bed. And right. they can't have that lipstick on when they get in the car. Right. You know, right. so we have. I think a lot about that. And I also think about how it's being targeted and marketed. Yeah, man. It's, it's so, man, that's, it's, a, it's a slippery slope. So one, you know, I wouldn't want anyone to be sexually harassed, regardless of age. And uh, I think it is a human instinct that when we think about children, um, it, it grows even more heightened awareness and, and, mm -hmm. and those things. And so um, two sides of the coin. One is, listen, it's 2022. The internet's been around for 20, 30 years now. Listen, you can't put everything out on the internet. You're going to have to guard yourself. You're going to have to protect yourself. Hopefully you have parents, teachers, somebody that can, friends, relatives, significant other that can warn you, educate you, so that you're not naive to certain tricks that people play on the internet to, to harass you. Okay, so that's one. On the other side of the coin is, I think sexual harassment, I think bully, cyber bullying and all of that, I think it's going to get a lot harder to do. I think the metaverse is probably the best caller ID for the internet that you could imagine. See, you used to could play on the phone. Let me go back. You, you used to could play on the phone and call somebody to do a prank call. Remember Bart Simpson and the Simpsons, he would call people, make these jokes, whatever. They didn't have caller ID in the Simpsons. Okay, call ID come out. You call my house and say, what? Right, I get not only get your phone number, but find out where you stay and all the other stuff with it. Well, in the metaverse, I don't think that, I think that it may not be there yet, but I think with AI and with the fact that you are projecting your own image or whatever your persona is in the metaverse, I think that that is going to give a lot more breadcrumbs for authorities or platforms to say we don't want that here yeah but we haven't seen evidence of them doing it now no we haven't no we so haven't. that that's what causes me to pause like, i think that it could be if the companies you know uh if their bottom line was aligned with what the if they really redefine their values like for which instance, gets back to i hate to interrupt but it gets back to the very point you made earlier about how much do you award that person Maybe there is something that you award them. I don't disagree. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much that is. Is it $10, $10 million? I don't know. Right? But I think when you start to do that, when you get that balance of legislation right, I think those things start to happen. Facebook changed from Facebook to Meta. Yeah. Not only for aesthetics, right? They were in, in court. I mean, they were in, in congressional hearings. Yeah. A lot prior to that name mm -hmm. change. There was a, a rebranding right, of right, Facebook, right, right. right? To kind of throw off some of the other stuff that was going on yeah. and, and set Facebook up in a different light. Yeah. And I, and, I, and you remember that whole meta concept, they was just two years before being called before Congress, they were uh, 
fighting with the legislator about whether or not they can have this this currency. You know, and that's what metal was being advertised for uh, legislatively at first. And no, not, not one country on the planet would go for it because they're like, no, you can't. We're not going to allow this company to uh, start a new currency. Exactly, and usurp the you know the the, the standard that we have. Right. The global uh, US, the U.S. dollar is the standard we have, and to have a private ownership of a brand new currency, we see what's happening in that space today. You know, look, a lot the of crypto drugs, is not going anywhere. No, absolutely, yeah. it's not. Yeah, it's, it's not, not going, going anywhere. anywhere. That cash out the bag. But how we actually, money. you know, but the the premise of that we. That blockchain technology is gonna just regulate this stuff is that's already been proven false. Because if, if blockchain technology was so good at regulating it, then why do the numbers of uh, of uh, uh, sex trafficking, drug trafficking, all those things continue to rise in that space specific, sp- particularly? I'm with you. So I, I think that some regulation is going to occur, right? Uh, when the internet was born, what was it like? 93 or something, mm-hmm. right? They didn't even but know what kind of law to write. First 91. Yeah. 93 became, it really kind of right. started going out. Right. You know, they didn't know what kind of law to write about. It. What is the internet, right? right? They didn't even think it was going to last or be real or whatever, mm-hmm. right? And now there's a zillion laws that govern payments and, and end user license agreements and all this other stuff that we had no concept of before the end. The thing, that's not legislation, though. That's the scary part. That's compliance. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. That is compliance. And, and these compliance officers, you know, FC, FCC sure. and stuff like they, it's not coded in legislation. Sure. That's the thing that sure. concerns sure. me. I got you. I got you. Yeah. Good point. Good and, and good delineation of that. Um, look, I, I think that it, it is a dilemma. It's not an easy one to solve. I think that as Meta grows, the metaverse grows. I just think that there's no way they're gonna skirt around somebody's putting some laws around that thing. There, it, it's just going to happen. Now, whether it's laws that you and I feel like, oh, this really helps, you know, like, hey, we got GPS. We got something for these laws. Like, this really brought us somewhere. Maybe not. You know, I don't know. Jury's still out. Yeah, yeah. Such a heavy topic. It is. Um, so, uh, I'm going to go tell <laughs> something a little bit lighter. All right. Um, what's going on in the foundation that you that you're supporting? Uh, I've seen a little bit on the social media. Oh man, you know, LinkedIn. Yeah, so I, I got a, I got my hand in a few different areas. I'm trying to, um, just trying to help the community. I mean, that's that's at the end of the day. Um, so I joined as a board member for Spark Dallas. That's a creative learning facility, and um, their premise is around um, if you can help a child to realize their creativity and retain hang on to the belief that they are creative. Mm. They will do better in in life and professionally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's the premise of that. Um, individually, what I've been doing is um, holding solar robot workshops in underserved communities. Mm-hmm. And um, in those uh, workshops, what we try to teach them, I can't teach a child robotics in two hours. What I can do is expose you to robotics. I can expose you to solar energy and how that works. I can, we can have some fun, some competitiveness in building the robots and racing the robots and maybe light a fire inside you so that you're inspired to go do this more. Maybe I can uh, work with children young enough that they can get into the, uh, the tech space and, and be successful because it's kind of hard to jump in senior year of high school and, right. you know, and go be right. a data scientist. And so um, the good news is, when I think about that type of program, um, me delivering workshops and showing up with some you know, colorful kicks on or something, mm-hmm. that's cool to a degree. But what's really cool to a middle schooler is a high schooler. And what's really cool to an elementary kid is a middle schooler. Right. And so for me, what I want to do is, or, or I am doing, is teaching high school students so they can deliver workshops to middle school students and middle school students deliver workshops to elementary school students. And all of the students who are delivering uh, workshops are getting paid as an intern, even at those levels. That way, what school, is an elementary school kid, what middle school do you wanna go to? The one where you get paid and you teach robots and you tell your story? Middle school, what high school do you wanna go to? The one where you get paid and you deliver workshops and you, and so now you create a 
a, a, a pull through, a draw, an ecosystem, right? Of pulling people and, and pushing STEM in our underserved community right. versus other things being pushed in our underserved community. Mm -hmm. So that is like, um, that's like the, the crown jewel for me to, to be able to uh, partner with some, and I recently have partnered with uh, Lancaster ISD, I'm working with Duncanville ISD, and we just struck a partnership with Perot Museum um, to do the, exactly that, so that uh, we can start to push STEM in communities, um, children of color, um, and have them more exposed to this. Are we even talking about STEM the right way? I think it can be, it, it can come across very elitist and aloof. Very much. It, it very, very much. can. And so, in those solar robot workshops, one of the, the key points that I try to make in that is we, we race building the robots, that's a race. And then the robots, we race them against each other, and that's a race. And then we stop and say, okay, well, what can make these robots go faster, slow, you know, whatever. And so the kids start coming up with different things. Oh, you can pull this off. You pull, well, why does that work? Well, it's less gravity, less weight. Well, why does that work? But okay, now we're talking about inertia, um, Newton's second law, et cetera, et cetera. Pause. These little ideas that you're having right now is the kernel of ingenuity, which leads to innovation and invention. For me, it was, you know, um, figuring out in the fourth grade I could I could sell candy and be able to buy more pizza. I, that was my creative idea as a kid starting to do something. For you, it might be this solar robot, but that little bit of ingenuity. We like to call it something else. Jerry rig it, hook it up, you know. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. we discount it, we discredit. Man, that ingenuity is worth billions. Yes. And so I think that for me, what I'm trying to do in that space to help that conversation is to say, look, I'm not having a traditional um, uh, OSC model discussion with you about the, the stacks of software development, no. We're going to put our hands on this thing. We're going to build something. You will see it work right now. And then we're going to talk about innovation. And I'm going to hopefully catch you in a moment where you can see your own creativity is making this thing work faster and work better. Don't lose that. You have those ideas all the time. Those voices, you hear them all the time. Those ideas and thoughts, you have them all the time. Don't lose that. For me, again, it started as a little kid trying to sell candy to buy more pizza. Now I saw pandemic level uh, issue uh, 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 matters. Uh, I have patents and engineer of the year awards. Okay, mm -hmm. it started small, and so that's the point that I feel like in the STEM discussion that we have to start infusing. Yes, science. Yes, math. But there's also creativity. Right. There's also non-traditional ways of getting there. Right. Engineering is is all about creativity itself. You know, and um, I always say this, I say this often that the most impressive uh, salesperson I, um, I ever met in my entire life mm -hmm. was a guy I went to um, high school with. And um, he went to, well, he went some, I think Georgia State University mm -hmm. his first year. Most impressive uh, salesperson I, uh, I met. So millions of dollars worth of crack and never touched it. <laughs> never mm -hmm. touched it. Impressive. Imagine if he was selling a service that really better a different it. product yeah that's why i think your idea and your concept is so important because a lot of those kids de depending on their neighborhood correct they're going to sell something to feed correct. feed themselves and their family in the advance why not sell a skill that Man. matters to them and going to contribute to to the, to the right. broader community and so and, and that's my dream is that you have students you have children in underserved communities and you know um little johnny's having a birthday party and instead of it being at Chuck E. Cheese, they're having a solar robot workshop and, you know, uh, Lil Ray is going to come over here and teach Lil John at Lil Johnny's party. Lil Ray get paid. Lil Johnny, all these kids are going to see it. They, they have a fun time. When we do these workshops, these kids go crazy right. about this stuff. I mean, they, it really turns the light on them. Every age. And we bring a piece of yeah, you know, yeah, you, I mean, want yeah. Little, you want some, you know, yeah, of course, of course, some pizza. Then we we buy the pizza and bring exactly. it to you. But you but know. I think that that is my goal is that we can have an entrepreneurial spirit with products and, and services, things that are uh, constructive versus destructive in our community. How do people get involved with that? Um, look, you can go to dcwtmt.com. Easy, David C. Williams, dcwtmt.com. Plug. Plug. So just. So yep. we got some exclusives? 
What's next? Um, it's a lot that's next, man. So you can't um, come to this show all right, and not throw out no exclusives. All right, so look. All right, so all right. Uh, <laughs> all right, so look. So um, I'm going to New York um, uh, June 13th to pick up a Stevie Award. My team won uh, a Bronze Award for uh, Information Technology Team of the Year. AT and T also won a Grand Stevie Award for Organization of the Year. There's like three, four thousand companies that compete for these. Wow. Uh, these slots. June 13th? June 13th. That's right after your birthday. It, right before. Then oh, the right. 15th through the 17th exclusive uh, Roadmap to Billions in New York Women's Tech Conference. Roadmap to Billions. You can check that out on my Instagram, David Chris Global. Um, but um, listen, that's going to be an amazing conference. So many people are going. Okay. And it's going to be in the city. It's going to be in New York. So it's going to be crazy. And then um, look, I got a book that's coming out, man. Okay. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I got a book that's coming out. Business model. It's uh, uh my first book. It it starts with uh, my story and you know my father committed suicide when I was eight. It, it talks about all that. It talks about how I um, came up through South Dallas and then it um, goes into uh, what I did and, and invented uh, to enable those forty thousand people to work from home. Okay. Wow. And win that engineer year award. When is it dropping? Oh, you, uh, August 16th. No, August 16th, 16th. it drops. Yep. And okay. um, it's available for pre sale. You can go to the, uh, businessmodelbook.com. Super easy to get there. Yeah. And um, yeah, please support. Oh, man. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. So, uh, ATT, what's next in that space? Chasing a billion dollars this year. Um, you know, I feel like. There's a, a lot that's actually uh, next in that space. There's a lot of machine learning that we're starting to infuse into our robotics processing. Um, there's, um, you know, a new business model that we're creating for customer service that I, I believe is going to enable uh, a ton of um, operating capital to be freed up as well as enable people to really free themselves uh, in their own spaces, right? Uh, make the type of money that uh, can change their situation. And so, um, it's a win-win. Rarely do you get that on, on both sides where a company can save money and an employee can earn more. But this is that. Sweet. Oh, yeah, this is that. This yeah. is that. This is happening. Very sweet. But, man, David, I really appreciate you for coming by, man. Chopping it up with yeah, me. Yeah, same here. As y'all heard, this man got a book coming out. Oh, one, one quick question. You going to have a lunch party? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It's okay. definitely going to be a lunch party. Um to be determined exactly location, but we'll okay. have it on the ground for everybody to check it out. All Absolutely. right, y'all make sure y'all follow this guy because he has a lavish party, as you can see with them nice <laughs> sneakers on. This man does it big. I really appreciate you for coming out. This has been another edition and installment of Let's Talk. All right, man, so y'all heard it here. IG, make sure you continue to follow him and on LinkedIn, David C. Williams. Uh, check out that lunch party. Be on the lookout for the new book that's coming out because he does it big. And we really appreciate you for stopping by on next edition of Let's Talk About It.